Brothers, this is just the test to confirm the audio. If you could just uh, type in real quick that you can hear me okay, we'll get started. Great. Here's the handout. Oh, there you go. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, one God. Amen. <clears throat> Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum. Benedicta tua mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Santa Maria, Mater Dei, ora per nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in ora mortis nostre. Amen. Our Lady, seat of wisdom, pray, pray for, for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, one God. Amen. So last class, we went over... Um, how to make your mental prayer, and we focus more or less entirely on that. This class, we're going to look at the parts of the chapter on prayer in general. Let's start with a, what a definition of prayer is. The life of prayer is the badge of a supernatural man. It is to pray always. And then what does it mean to pray always? To pray always is always to feel the sweet urgency of prayer and to hunger after it. This is one of the most perplexing um, sections of scripture because everywhere, uh, several places it exhorts us to pray without ceasing. And of course the epistles and then Christ also says that we should also pray always. Throughout history, Different saints, different times, and different peoples have tried to conform themselves to this. But if I was to put my own words on it, I would say that prayer, in and of itself, to pray always is then to keep the continual memory of God and also our continual desire to worship Him. This is how we truly can say something like St. Francis of Assisi, where he says, my prayer is my life. Not misunderstood like it is today as some type of form of activism, but that rather one in a state of constant prayer, the constant memory and presence of God, and the desire to always please him in everything, conforms their actions, their outward actions to this reality. Our rule speaks of this directly when it says, prefer nothing to the love of Christ in chapter 4. Being aware that God is with us and watching us, this means truly that our thoughts and our actions can always be targeted at and pleasing, uh, to be made to be pleasing to our Lord Jesus Christ. This is truly what it means to be convinced that God watches us everywhere. To be deeply aware of this truth, that God watches us everywhere, and then not to conform our lives to it, leads to great spiritual gloom. You have experienced this if you've ever been caught up in the whirlwind of continual sin for any period of time. If you are a person of prayer, this gloom comes upon you because you feel this conflict between your knowledge and your intellect that God is watching you, but on the other hand, your inability to conform to what God desires for you. It also helps us understand the extreme actions, or what appear to be extreme but are not, of the saints when they did things like throw themselves in the thorn bushes, make continual prostrations, or use things such as the discipline. 
However, St. Thomas Aquinas does teach, and our author here uh, also teaches, that one of the consequences that arises from this attraction to God, that desire to always pray, is that we need to set specific times for prayer, both vocal and mental. We Our rule speaks about this in numerous places, but in particular, in chapter 7, on the formation of novices. It says that the novice master is to guide the attitude of the novice to prayer, and then also to the constant practice of reciting the divine office. The divine office, which is rightfully called the work of God, recollects us then at given intervals throughout the day. If we were to say the office the way that the church envisions it, never more than two or three hours pass between a, at least a substantial amount of vocal prayer is said that directs our minds towards God and towards the living body, which is the church constantly. It creates, in a sense, a mini judgment. We must force ourselves to go before God and render him an, a service. And so, if a knight falls, it should only ever be for a short amount of time before he forces himself into a form of recollection again. The Grand Master spoke of this in his 2016 letter to us. Quote, the fact that our recital of the divine office was meant to be said in a monastic fashion, and therefore it has to be recited around the most appropriate time. If we do this, that is, render the service to God, not only do we get that sweet urgency of prayer and satisfy our hunger for it, we also begin to see many things in conflict with a life of prayer, things that we must start eliminating from our lives. Long day trips, movies, things that would interfere with this faithful recitation of the office all of a sudden either have to be pared back or eliminated entirely. This may seem like a painful decision, but it is not. It is actually a decision of great freedom. Although it may be painful for other people, and initially, while we are learning to govern our affections in a rightly ordered way, it may feel awkward at first. A concrete example of this would be, I was invited over to somebody's house for a lunch or a dinner. Unfortunately, they live 45 minutes away from the Priory. We say the office on every Saturday together as a community in Vespers. It's just simply not possible for me to miss it unless I'm ill or there's some real grave reason, not for a pleasure trip. So I said I'd be happy to go, but that I would have to be back in time for Vespers, or it would have to happen after Vespers. The person, nevertheless, cheerfully accepted this, but the reality of 45 minutes away meant that the dinner was going to be at a very late hour or was going to be very early in the afternoon. And thus, it just never really happened, and that's okay. Seeing that we also need time for mental prayer, in the document Growth and Criteria for Growth, which was adopted by the general chapter, it says, quote, structure the beginning of their day by seeing the recitation of the first part of the office in at least a quarter of an hour of mental prayer. Just to reiterate, the reason why a quarter of hour of mental prayer is taken, when we go over the structure of mental prayer, we see that even if we were to do a bare bones, place, thanking God, placing ourselves in his presence, repenting of our sins, asking for divine assistance, a brief consideration, making resolutions, offering acts of worship, thanking God for spending time in his presence and then helping for our assistance in uh, doing resolutions and repenting of how badly we did our mental prayer, that will take at least 15 minutes. It also says, quote, reserve other moments of the day at the beginning and the end of the afternoon for prayer. That's, of course, anticipating Sexton known. And to conclude the day with an examination of conscience and the last hour of the office. It also exhorts us, quote, to have recourse to all the traditional forms of devotion, first among which is the frequent recitation of the Holy Rosary, that favored weapon, the battle of the Templar Knight. 
Of course, saying all traditional forms of devotion, the key word there is traditional. We don't adopt new things. That's not our preference, and that's not exactly what we're about. Although, to be honest, there really isn't anything new. Everything that's there occasionally something that's old gets brought out to the forefront again. But I would view that, like, for example, as an explicit repudiation of things like centering prayer and so forth, which are kind of pop sensations within the church. It is also the only place in our document that I can remember, other than a very brief mentioning in the Constitution where the rosary is mentioned. To live in the world of prayer, and the world of prayer is its own world, that is the hidden kingdom of heaven. It is the secret of the kingdom. To live in this world habitually is to become strange. That doesn't mean you're going to necessarily have people immediately look at you and think you're strange. But the things you say and the way you act, your conclusions on how things are going to turn out, are going to be guided by prayer. Prayer is intimacy between you and God. So, for example, we know for a fact that no good is ever going to come of evil. The more you pray, the more that will become seated in your heart. And so a man of prayer always knows through his prayer that evil's victory is very short and that all these evil doings will come undone. So we don't ever have to panic about certain really bad things getting seated in mankind for an extended period of time because God will bring him to ruin. He always does. It also mentioned in the text, so it's not here, that this doesn't, you know, people think that that's going to make us like angels, where all of a sudden there's going to be a magnetism that attracts people to us. This is both true and untrue. He says it's not always true. I believe that um, when we look at, for example, the life of St. Philip Neri, people used to being able to just stand by his door, and because the presence of God was so deep in him, they could literally have their peace restored. At the other end of that spectrum, though, worldly people, the more that God dwells in a person, the more just hostile and angry, especially people of false piety, it makes them. This is very common, you see, there's... Excuse me, brothers. I forgot to close out on my work phone. Okay. The more hateful a person becomes to, to worldly people at the other end. There's an idea floating around in the church today. It's not completely incorrect. Several well-known figures have said it, but I don't necessarily agree with it. And one, all, all one has to do is look at the life of Christ to see that it is a limited view. Christ himself was holiness. Yet he was despised, rejected, had no place to lay his head. Also, his holiness was not always apparent to people. They rejected him because they viewed him as the son of the carpenter. A prophet is always rejected in his town. When he went up to the temple, they didn't even know what region he was and argued amongst themselves about it. Many were enraged and plotted to murder him. So the modern idea that many well-known figures are advancing is this idea that the only solution to evangelism is holiness. They misunderstand we need to become holy first before we can be effective evangelizers because God is not going to bless a bad tree. 
you're better off working on yourself, amending your life of sin, eliminating all your grave faults, and truly living a life governed not only by the commandments, but the evangelical precepts before trying to convert everybody around you. And then you may have a fruitful missionary effort. But it does not follow that if you do all those things, that people are necessarily going to feel magnetically attracted to you. That is wrong. If anybody disagrees with me, they can explain to me how they can reconcile that with what we observed from Christ himself in the gospel. So they're right, but they, they aren't getting the principle. We can't be effective unless we at least have that obedience to the commandments first, and we're living the life, as St. James put it right, unspotted from the world and relieving widows and orphans. So what is mental prayer in general? Mental prayer means the occupation of our faculties upon God. That would be our intellect and our will in our thoughts, in our heart, not in the way of thinking of or speculating about him, but stirring up the will to conform itself to him and the affections to love him. And so we can see here this is a very broad definition and tons of things fall under it. At the last class, several people asked me about Lectio Divina being um, acceptable as a form of meditation. Of course. It is because it has this end. It's to stir up our will to conform ourselves to God. That's the end of Lexio. Bible study is to, of course, learn about God and to learn about the substance of the scriptures and what they teach. Mental prayer is beset by certain temptations. The reason why it's beset by so many temptations is because it can be a very irksome activity. The first difficulty is that we can struggle to keep our thoughts on what we are trying to meditate about. We can have fatigue of the body due to the posture that's adopted. If you kneel, of course, your knees can become sore at a point. If you sit, you may become lethargic. If you stand to try to meditate, your feet may begin to ache. I assure you that while it is true at some points, you may uh, forget about these things within the context of prayer. You will remember them later. St. Teresa of Avila, when talking about nuns having ecstasies and raptures, warned that their bodies still experience fatigue and that they should be given more or less light duties after an extended period of time where they are having these experiences because their bodies would be exhausted from it. So just remember that you're not doing anything wrong if your body is experiencing some type of pain or fatigue that's just normal. We, of course, have distractions at every turn. Now, this isn't so bad. The distractions aren't as bad as you might think. The distractions actually help us understand ourselves, what we need to repent of, and the things in our life that we need to start cutting away at because they're interfering with our ability to pray. There is an abundance of visual stimulation in the world today in the form of everything on electronic screens. These things impress deep memories onto our mind. They, like, they burn into it. If we watch these things all the time, they will come out during mental prayer, and we're going to have to start putting some effort into purifying it. That may mean walking away from many of these things or figuring out ways that we can begin to only seek out those things that help us turn to God. No, I don't think it is possible to really do long mental prayer. Have it, it, It's going to be very compatible to have sweet long mental prayer if one's life is accompanied by long periods of time of indulging in visual stimuli every single day. The two will come in conflict with each other. Sensible devotion comes and goes in mental prayer. And then finally, the lack of constancy. He identifies this as a temptation or something that can make it irksome. If we have a set time to do our mental prayer every day, 
no matter how hard you try every now and then it's going to get thrown off i just recommend having a backup time <laughs> that you can just re-recollect yourself and just if this falls apart i will do it then and ideally as soon as possible in as similar as a place as possible so all things being equal we anticipate our environment I will add that a lot of people do mental prayer at mass. They don't even necessarily realize they're doing it, but that's why they hate children making the noise that they do during mass. And they feel irked by that and very upset, and I can't blame them for those feelings of irksomeness. However, it also, we can't just make the time we spend at mass our mental time prayer because of just the reality of not being in control of that environment and it being being around other people. That's why our Lord said, let a man enter into his closet. Right? When he said that, he said, you more or less be away from others, to have that solitariness. Now, this can be done in a group setting, like when you all go to a holy hour or benediction and there's silence. But oftentimes... You know, people leave their children at home, for example, and the only interruptions that are going to happen are not from somebody deciding to shout out the rosary or something while everybody's being silent. But the time is set aside for silence so that people can do private meditation. So he has some solutions to these temptations. And the biggest one was to make meditation the highlight of your day. Now, if you remember on the handout that's on the website, the golden rules of saying the office, it says the same thing, make the office the most important part of your day. You're going to see this in spiritual uh, works. You're going to see make the reception of communion the highlight of your day. Make mental prayer the highlight of your day. Make the divine office the highlight of your day. I think what we're seeing here is make the most intimate moment with God the most important part of your day. And that intimacy is experienced during these times that are set aside for God. And the more time that can be set aside in preparation for God's gift, the more intimate it will be. The way to look at this is the difference between waking up and giving your wife like a peck before you head off to the office versus spending an evening on a date with her. That one washes themselves, cleans themselves, puts on nice clothing, makes reservations, oftentimes in advance, spends time focused on the other person, has the nice meal, right? sets aside all of their cares and worries, has a babysitter for the kids and so forth, and then they spend that in intimacy with God. And so much so with things like the Mass, which on a, day, you know, a daily Mass will take about 40 minutes just to hear it, right? You can do the same thing. Or with mental prayer, if you can do like your holy hour, anticipate it, set everything aside, look forward to it, Think ahead of time about what you want to talk to God about without talking to him yet, but to anticipate his presence in the Holy Eucharist and then to be able to speak directly to him in his presence. That's how we begin to make these things the highlight of our day. And even more so, by engaging in these actions, we're acknowledging the humanity of Christ, that he truly is our friend and brother, and also that... Um, our thoughts are becoming to be dominated by an anticipation of the presence of God, which is life eternal. That's why we want to go to heaven. Um, he also recommends, of course, getting rid of useless reading. That was just a little highlight there. Um, There's a, a, a term that one elder used for that, I forgot, but basically he said vain, vain thoughts, material for vain thoughts.
But if we go back to that, we, we see how bad vain reading can come into conflict with that perpetual memory of God. Now, by the way, the normal trajectory which your soul will follow, or um, what I have seen, is that at first one continues to do the reading that they do. And what one, as one reads, or for example, watches a film, they begin to see everything in it as going either for or against the moral life, or if God is pleased with this action or not pleased with this action. And then even in it, over time, this kind of moves away to the point that one spends more time dwelling on like the morality of a film or the morality of God's law or how God is affected by these like fantastic actions to the point that eventually it just dropped altogether because you're just not getting, you just rather go read. You'd rather go uh, to, to pray than to, you don't, you're no longer refreshed by it. That's just a normal kind of trajectory on that with the useless reading. Same thing with, um, the news where one reads the news and it's kind of moves them to pray. It either moves them to pray or it moves them to feel like the heart of God. Like, um, when we hear about bad things in the church, we should feel afflicted. And over time, we begin to realize that the affliction is always there, no matter what. And so maybe we don't even feel the need to read because we already know that God's heart is afflicted, so we already pray without knowing. St. Charbel, um, I mention this because it's, I think, a great example of how we can put aside news. He never wanted to meet family members when they came to the monastery or read their letters. And when his superior asked them why, he said, uh, didn't he want to have reasons to pray for his country and didn't he want to know what's happening with his family? His reply was, I always pray for our country and I would only tell my family members to be good Christians and I already pray for them every day. Hearing about their particulars won't basically change that. He didn't add that part. And so his superior never bothered him again about it. Okay. So what are some obstacles that we can remove to improve our meditation? We have to abandon a good opinion of ourselves. This comes in degrees. The great saints saw themselves as a wor the worst sinners. We can't force such a feeling. It comes on its own with time. If we don't have it, we should be aware that it is a very, very desirable thing. St. Francis de Sales, in introduction to devout life, of course, very much cautions against saying those things in prayer before we actually mean it. So it's important for us to see ourselves as a bad person, and normally we can make the starting point in that our predominant fault or sin, and then allow that to guide us to that other conclusion eventually. This may take a long time. And that's okay. Just remember what the rule says. Do not wish to be called a saint before being one. Another thing we have to put great effort into to improve our time in meditation is we have to make sure that we're taking efforts to conceal all of our good works. If we don't conceal our good works, there's almost like a repulsion that happens at meditation from us. This is in the parable of the Pharisee and the publican, where he exalted himself for his good works. And so we not only want to conceal our good works from others, we even want to conceal them from ourselves. And remember the admonition of Christ, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Just forget about them. They're done they're over with, and guess what? Until you're dead, you don't even know if they were pleasing to God. We have to restrain our senses. This is a particularly vulnerable time of the year after Lent. It's important to remember what happened when Moses went up the mountain with the Ten Commandments. 
the people made the calf and then they feasted and then it said they sat down to play. Now, I have read that as meaning that they engaged in immorality, but I will add to it my own thought on this. When we see the beautiful things of God's world, its sounds, its smells, its, so uh, its songs, its sights, our hearts should be inflamed with gratitude towards God. And we should bless God. We should thank God. This being called the contemplation of the senses is the method which St. Francis de Sales and others of the French school really strongly encourage for beginners. But more often or not, what happens is a little evil voice comes to our mind and it says, Delight yourself and take whatever, you know, Phil want and be holy tomorrow. And so instead of taking a little bit to refresh our spirits so we can return to our prayer, return to our work, we overindulge ourselves. The rule for a reason says that at every meal we're never supposed to fully satiate ourselves and so we should pursue all manner of pleasures never to fully satisfy our desire for them. You will find if you obey this type of self-restraint that God will bless you with a more abundant life, not materially. What I mean is that your gratitude for the things of this world will increase. To illustrate this, I wish to tell you a story about St. Peter of Alcantara. St. Peter of Alcantara was once pressed by some laymen he was friends with to attend a feast. He never liked going to laymen's homes. Yet they were so entreated him and they asked him for the love of God, he went. And upon coming to their home, and through they were very wealthy, they had prepared a tremendous spread in front of this friar who lived on bread and herbs. He looked at it, and then he fell into an ecstasy. This ecstasy lasted hours, where he was literally frozen before people, unable to move, completely in that trance-like state that we expect from saints. And the people watched with great amazement at this, every so often looking back, wondering how long it was last, being worried what it meant. He came out of the ecstasy, went over, served himself up a big bowl of broth, drank it, Bless the bless the uh, bless them, and then left. And then they asked him before he left, "Why? What happened?" And he goes, "I was I had I I was overcome with God's generosity to His creatures." That was, of course, after decades and decades of spiritual service of God that he enjoyed that. But he enjoyed that feast, I assure you, far greater than those who partook of the actual food. He delighted in it more. Finally, allowing ourselves to engage in what I will call ordinary actions. The author, I felt, was a little confusing here. But what he means is that doing ordinary things without a supernatural intention. So we want to supernaturalize everything. We see this, uh, most of you are familiar with this day, seeing it the little way of St. Therese, but she more or less was a master of teaching this method, which was do everything you're supposed to do and then do it a little better for God. The heart of this is in the gospel where he says, right, if you are pressed into service one mile, go two. You know, if you're, uh, I forgot, uh, if something's taken from you, offer your cloak as well. We do everything for the love of God and we do everything as best as we can for God. Don't allow a single merit to be lost from you. By the way, this can seem crushing at first, but back to that life of prayer again. Keep the continual memory of God. And if you just, as St. Augustine ta teaches, if you just do something with the intention of pleasing God like the dishes, that's going the second mile. He, he uses it as an allegory for having both our heart and our body in it. So put our heart into it. If God didn't want us to do mundane things, 
then he wouldn't make doing mundane things a necessity every single day. And contrary to what maybe some 16th century mystics may have said, Christ, the Virgin Mary, and St. Joseph most definitely did chores, not choirs of angels waiting on them like they were imperial people. I mean, why would Christ have washed the feet then if he wasn't already, I mean, he already, we know that he did actions that would have been viewed as abasing. So that is a helpful meditation of doing that, that when Christ washed feet, when he drew water, when he did the, these things were infinitely pleasing to God. Okay, effective prayer. What is effective prayer? One does not set aside time for effective prayer. Effective prayer is something that happens in the course of other prayers. It is the predominance of acts of love. When effective prayer starts to happen in your spiritual life, it generally causes a crisis. A person's confused by it. Why? Because this is the area where delusions really start coming out hard. If we don't allow ourselves to give in to effective prayer, we're going to stop showing fidelity to grace because it's actually something necessary for the overcoming of sin and the growth of the spiritual life. And we can also spend a lot of time paddling around in the water. I will give you a concrete example. The recitation of the rosary is a wonderful and pious custom. When Blessed Anna Maria Taiji used to say her rosary with her family, every now and then she fell into trances or ecstasy. That's not effective prayer. But I just want to highlight here how powerful the recitation of the rosary uh, can be. Like just bringing a soul into the type of acts that dispose themselves for God to start taking over. Effective prayer would have you stop saying the vocal prayers and start using your own words to make acts of love towards God while meditating on the mysteries by pausing saying the rosary, unless, of course, you're with somebody else. If not, then your rosary will literally drop off, become a dry exercise. You won't gain the graces that God wanted you to do it when you're saying it in private. That's just an example of what I'm talking about here. Same thing if you're filing a prayer book that lines out maybe the liturgical year or the 30-day meditation book I sent out to people. Effective prayer can literally yank you out of a meditation of death, make you think about Christ's death, and then have you just thank God or make acts of love for his death. So how do we know that God is pulling us, in a sense, into effective prayer? We're not able to think well on a topic like examining it in our mind. We feel just intensely drawn to make acts of love. If we try to keep thinking on a topic, we start getting feelings of disgust in our souls. That if we are able to consider the truths of the faith, that is something like, God's um, uh, incarnation, instead of being able to look at all the consequences that maybe arose from it to start making our petitions and so forth, we just kind of hear the word and we start making acts of love towards God. In fact, this is the nor this is very normal. Sorry, guys. I'm like falling over there. This is very normal in that a person will start making effective prayer during their meditation and kind of just they don't even realize it in the sense like you don't go, oh, it's time for effective prayer and like switch a switch on. It's more like you're considering it and then all these acts of love come and then you look down your 15 minutes, your 30 minutes, your hour, however much you've been there the entire time and yet you haven't really been doing much more than making these acts of love to God. Now, to knock everybody down a peg, generally people who start hitting this type of prayer regularly have a great horror for sin in their lives. A horror. That includes venial sin. 
they begin to feel coldness towards amusements. Our speech at this point becomes much more moderated in regards especially to things like speaking about other people when they're not present or criticisms. And the soul develops a love for mortifications, not just a like, a love of them, and that it begins to like to find ways, even though this isn't like, I mean, this is, these are voluntary mortifications to afflict themselves. Why? As Father Alban talked about in his homily last night, right? We desire to know the love of God, and God came and he suffered. And so a person who starts to love God in this manner also feels the need to suffer. They want to suffer something for God. The fruit of effective prayer is an intense love of God. I mean, this is like a love, like falling in love type of love. It is an intense desire to do God's will and to give God glory. Almost, it's like an otherworldly energy. A person starts desiring and craving Holy Communion more. A desire to be alone from others for the point of being with God. In the uh, way of the pilgrim, that wonderful uh, Russian classic on the spiritual life, he, he is writing his journal, and that's what the book is. It's just his journal. And he talks about this at several points where somebody would say something to him that would inflame his heart with love of God, and he would just all of a sudden want to leave so he could pray because he would be inflamed with this love, and he just had to get away to pray at this point because he feels this like very in his you know flesh. A burning desire to speak of and about God with others. A desire to die and be with God. St. Paul, right? I desire to be dissolved and be with Christ. A zeal for souls. Just to make mention, this is a complicated one because, as the Father Faber mentioned in the other, um, much earlier in the book, he talked about how some people aren't led to that so much as it leads them to a deeper and deeper repentance to save their own soul, too. And finally, hatred for the world. If the world bothers them. They'd rather just be away from it. And I mean, you know how strong hate is as a word, and it's not chosen lightly like a strong dislike, but they, they hate it. It's, it's so bothersome to them. It's hard on this one being a secular because, I mean, I hate doing certain tasks that are what I have to do in the world. I particularly hate going through snail mail, for example. So we can't, like, view disgust at mundane action as this, but more like the world would have us focus on things that are unimportant, which is not our salvation. And we just despise that. Normally, the stage is accompanied with gifts, though God, of course, gives gifts according to what's beneficial to him. These are gifts, though, that he oftentimes gives when a person reaches effective prayer. The gift of tears. The gift of tears is a form of weeping that happens during the course of prayer, and its origins are supernatural. This isn't stirring oneself up to cry, which we can, of course, do. You may ask, can I know if I have the gift of tears or not? You yourself know, but you can put something like that before a director, and then he might be able to, to give some ideas. We, of course, oftentimes weep when we're deeply distressed over exterior circumstances. I think one of the things that you may see is that with these tears is that they can happen when all the natural things should not be moving us to pray. For example, we experience deep peace within the soul, right? Um, we're focused on God, and they just come about in the course of prayer. So that's a gift, and you should bless God for them. However, as we will mention in a second here, delusions really start coming out hard at this point. One of the things you can do to fight delusions of the gift of tears 
is to follow the counsel of St. Matilda, which is to offer all your tears to the Sacred Heart, and that God purify them if there's self-love in them or self-delusion. I'm very, it's very important that we not begin to trust something that we think is a gift and just keep commending it back to God and saying what an unworthy vessel we are and to really mean it. By the way, because the devil gets to see all these things too, there's a reason why the prayers before we say the office is um, all vain and distracting thoughts, all vain thoughts. So great vanity can accompany gifts in prayer. It's something to be on the guard of. Touches of the soul. These are feelings that arise within our soul, and they deeply penetrate us. This isn't more like, at the level of mental prayer, when we're just considering truths, there's like a satisfaction we get for seeing relations. Touches of soul is when you feel a deep impression in the soul and a great conviction within the things. These things can happen outside of prayer too. Where one is just living their life, but because they're living it in the presence of God, like God will impress deeply at a moment upon the soul a touch. The wound of love. This is this is the the pain that is accompanied with love of being apart from somebody you love. So and it varies in intensity. It can be light. It can be more intense than heartbreak. If you've ever experienced heartbreak, you will know what a feeling it is. But unlike heartbreak, which oftentimes is accompanied with kind of a human despair because we've lost natural happiness, this one isn't accompanied with despair. It's, it's like a joyful sorrow, right? It's blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted, that's kind of the union of what you want to look for. Because there's oftentimes this intense mourning over how God's deeply afflicted by your sins and the sins of the world. For they shall be comforted. This is the comfort God is giving you, right? He's letting you share in that wound of love. This is directly what uh, Father Alvin was talking about last night in his homily. Please check that out on the Canon's uh, YouTube. He talks about this wound of love perfectly to describe it at length. We get glimpses of our own nothingness. This is actually a great alleviation of the soul. When we realize how nothing we are. You would think it would de devastate us, but it actually doesn't. Rather, in seeing our own nothingness and that God really is the end of all things and he's moving everything, it allows, it, it's a great building up of the confidence of God. St. Francis of Assisi used to spend all night in prayer saying this, Who are you and what am I? That is a great description here of our own nothingness. Who are you, God, and what am I? Tangible sweetness in prayer. This is the experience of the disciples at Aramaeus where they said, Stay with us. It's towards the evening. Right? You, you almost don't want to leave and go and do your duties. Okay. Vocal prayer. Vocal prayer, there's two schools of thought on if it's necessary for salvation. And I think what we'll see here, St. Thomas Aquinas said, no. And he's right. Because a baby cannot, if it's baptized and it dies, it doesn't make vocal prayer. However, when we look at St. Augustine, he says, it is necessary for salvation. <laughs> of course, we see that he's talking about adults. So I think we could reconcile both. Maybe St. Thomas... Um, was more strict in his understanding. The author raised that tension, so I just wanted to mention my own thoughts on his tension. Christ taught us how to pray vocally. I think that closes the book on whether or not from an apologetics point of view, if it's necessary. And of course, in this brotherhood, you will do a lot of vocal prayer. 
So what is the utility of vocal prayer throughout the day? It's going to awaken again and again that interior devotion, and it's going to sustain it. We ought to honor God with all of our gifts, and that includes our voice. And finally, it gives a vent to our interior devotion, otherwise we might explode. This is really simple to understand. When you love something, you want to speak about it, think about it, draw about it, everything about it. And so why would a soul not want to speak to God with love if, it, if he loved God and above all things? Okay, I see what happened here. I thought my outline had a problem with it. You'll notice here on this section here, I was not done with um, uh, effective prayer. I was wondered where those went. So let me go backwards, sorry. Once we reach the stage of effective prayer in prayer, believe it or not, distractions can become much more intense at this stage. As a soul starts being moved to make more acts of love of God, they also will experience more distractions. The next stage in prayer is called the prayer of quiet, where one just dwells, rests, and gazes at God. So these distractions, as I said earlier, are actually helpful at, uh, at us figuring out how to eliminate things that are causing these types of agitations in our soul. At this stage of prayer, there's going to be many more temptations to vanity, which I also already mentioned. And it's also going to cause anger. At this stage, we start to experience more anger in the service of God. When one loves something, because this is still a very young love, and they observe other people not loving God, it will probably lead to feelings, and it's human to lead to feelings of anger. We see this, of course, with the right, the Thunder Brothers, St. John and St. James, wanting to call down destruction on any city that rejected Christ. And he said, oh, no, you don't know what you're asking for. Well, it's kind of the same idea. So with that being said, I don't like it when people go, tisk tisk tisk. people are angry that God isn't being loved. It's just a sign that the love there needs to be taught and guided. It's actually a good sign that somebody feels so much love that they get angry when others do not love. But it's a young love. It's like the love that exists early in a marriage versus the love that exists after many years of marriage. It's like the love that exists for a country when one, you know, signs up to serve in the military versus the love which one experiences one's country once they have been in many battles. It's different because it's developed. Okay, back to the three attentions of vocal prayer. These may not always happen all at once. We must pay very close attention to the order and the enunciation of the words. We must not forget whom we are speaking to. So that goes for God and saints or holy souls if we're praying to them. And we have to pay great attention to what we are asking for. So this gives rise, and I, I feel the need to, to bring this up. Many people like to say the rosary in the car or things of that sort. That's fine. But don't view it as an act, exercise in vocal prayer. View it as an exercise in later um, here this ejaculatory, I mean, it's an exercise in vocal prayer, but you should view car rosaries as your ejac uh, ejaculatory prayer, not as vocal prayer, like you would from a book from your office or whatever. And it's important that when you go to direction that you make these distinctions to your director. So if you say, I pray the rosary every day, but you say it in the car on the way to work, that's a different level of attention, and it has a different end. Saying the rosary in the car on the way to work is a way to keep the memory of God alive in you or to keep the thought of God. 
but it's not really giving your full attention to the prayer. And so by its nature, it's not like effective inter intercessory prayer per se. It can be. This is very complicated because what I am trying to impress, and I think the author also is trying to press, is that if we want to obtain answers to our prayer, we have to give them great attention. And so we don't want to just like put some sloppy intentions on a rosary in the car and then think that we've really prayed for something. Rather, we can renew intentions from earlier prayers on that rosary in the car. I think that's the way to put it. And then um, there are four kinds of vocal prayer, with a book, without a book, intercessor, intercessory, and ejaculatory. When you're using a prayer book, it's best to use one. St. John of the Cross talks about this too, how when God's touched a soul, initially they just want every prayer book. I've been there. <laughs> I don't want to say God touched a soul, but... Like every prayer book, it's changing prayer books for all these particular devotions. That's just not a good idea. Better to get one big prayer book if you, in addition to your office, or stick with one prayer book for a while when you sit down to pray. That way you don't have to constantly be switching books. Now, with that being said, uh, if you've been here at the Priory, sometimes you'll, you know, if you've seen me at the church, I'll bring in like three books, but generally... One's uh, my bravery, one's my meditation, and then one may be a big prayer book. That's the system I like to use. Um, if I'm going to be attempting to pray for a long time, that's what I would recommend is, you know, have where you want to go. Because oftentimes good meditation books um, can be separate um, than like good vocal prayer books. Prayer should be said with pauses. There's just no point in trying to rush through it. Say fewer prayers if you have to, but say them with pauses. Allow yourself to enjoy sweet lingerings between prayers when you're saying them by yourself, especially your office. No need to rush unless you have somewhere to be. Take your time. Enjoy those things. Don't become attached to them, but if God's touching your soul, by all means, Allow him to. There are some books and some mystics who tried hard to actually like push these things away. If you're at that level with your spiritual director, let him guide you on that. Almost every other book I've ever read said for us who are all beginners, I think, um, we should enjoy those prayers because they help strengthen us to make the renunciations that we need to make in our lives to grow in the life of prayer. It's also best to pick books that match our current disposition towards God. As I've said, I don't particularly like the, the divine intimacy because the colloquies don't really match my disposition. Oftentimes, some of them are okay. I particularly like authors that are brief, sincere. I, I One book that particularly matches uh, my own feelings are, um, I like St. Ephraim's Psalter. I also like St. Bonaventure's Prayers of the Virgin. I like St. Uh, uh, Gregory Nararach, who's the Armenian doctor of the church, his Psalter. He wrote his own Psalter too. Those are all very much to my personal disposition. I also am a big believer, he doesn't mention this here, in reading a prayer book before using a prayer book. So you can figure out which prayers and devotions you feel very moved to use. And you just skip over the rest of them. When you pray without a book, be brief and say a few words. This is in sacred scripture. I mentioned it in my last conference. You should think about what you're going to say before you say it out loud. Don't forget who you're talking to, which is God. If you spontaneously, occasionally say something out loud to God and it's good, that's fine. I mean, I wouldn't like bring it up in confession, but as a rule of thumb, you want to think about what you say before you say it. God will love you for this. It shows reverence for him. The last thing to go in your spiritual life, by the way, is reverence. It's the worst sign. 
when somebody abandons reverence. Intercessory prayer. Be very wary of agreeing to pray for other people's intentions. Say you'll try to. If you agree to do it, do it immediately, especially in your office. If those thoughts keep coming back to you, oftentimes it's a sign that God wants to answer that prayer and that sometimes the condition for other of your prayers being answered is actually you obtaining a benefit for somebody else. This is something that I'm not speaking necessarily from a book I've read, but it's just been maybe some experiences that I've seen and had. Be very wary about taking too many novenas at once, too. One way to be very graceful if somebody has you like on prayer emails is to say, I'll include these intentions in my office. Or I'll try. That's even better. Finally, ejaculatory prayer should be frequent but not under a strict rule. I put a little asterisk here. Once you emerge from a pious custom of ejaculatory prayer, for example, the Jesus prayer, the rosary, or anything else, one of the things you will find that is very, very helpful towards developing this practice is to say a certain number of these prayers every day, whether on your rosary, using a mechanical clicker, um, saying it for a certain period of time without interruption. And so that is something that you should put under a strict rule if you're going to make that a part of your life, in my opinion. But we don't require it in the nights. But ejaculatory prayer is very, very helpful towards developing that memory and presence of God. So when prayers are answered, St. Bernard teaches that prayers are bad because they are either timid, tepid, or temerious. You can start with prayer feeling timid. Keep praying until it's not. You can start a prayer and not really feel stirred up. Well, keep saying the prayer until you feel stirred up. This is one of the most effective things about doing things like repeated actions, like making the sign of the cross again and again and again. St. Dominic used to make so many signs of the cross in public, they used to think he was swatting away flies from himself all the time. And of course, to Mary's prayer as well, you can't expect God to give you something evil, so, or if you treat God flippantly, he's not going to answer your prayer. Not in a good way, anyway. So what do answered prayers have in common? Generally, they are long in coming. Not always, by the way. That was an interesting thing he said. I think God does answer prayers quickly sometimes. Oftentimes, they come in a different way, though, than what has been asked. That is very true. The more secret the prayer, the more quickly it gets answered. This is also a complex one. I have to admit, I, I agree with him that we need to keep our prayers, how much we pray in secret. But I've also found that the act of humbling yourself before other people and asking for prayers for a particular intention, if done with, with, with humility and like that inner disposition that I'm not good enough to obtain this end, actually really speeds up the, the process of getting a prayer answered. Especially if that person has either the office of intercession, like a priest or a monk, is your brother in religion, like one of the other knights, is a family member, or has, you know, if somebody genuinely comes to you and says, if you ever have any intentions, please, I like to pray for people, that's my apostolate, by all means, give these people your intentions. It's good for you. You can always just say, please pray for, and then just general, not too specific. That That's probably the most ideal of both worlds. The power of our prayer is also directly related to our constant communication with God and simple faith. Once again, back to that constant presence of God and to that ejaculatory prayer. If we do that all the time, our prayers are going to be much stronger. You also see how with these, when, when that, if, if you're able to make that happen, what happens is 
Because one is constantly speaking to God, one's heart is always disposed to ask God in the right way. So when something is time sensitive, for example, a medical emergency or something, and somebody asks you to pray for it, the mind just kind of easily glides over to it. There are three gifts of prayer. The gift of prayer itself. With faith, we know that spending time in prayer is spending time in the presence of God, which is the greatest reward a person can have in this life, is to be near to God. The longer a prayer is, the more merit there is in persevering in it. This is, of course, I believe, him meaning that we repeat the intention over a long period of time. Although, once again, consider the power of a holy hour or an all-night vigil and see how quickly those prayers are answered. St. Martin of Tours once had a problem, and his solution to it was, I will just go pray and fast until God answers my prayer. And incredible. I wish a bishop would do that today. Just once. Like... I mean, I, I, I would have wanted to say it on his Facebook page, but it'd be really great for like a miracle to happen and to say, oh, well, how did this come about? Well, I went to be a three-day retreat where I just wouldn't eat and I just prayed ceaselessly to God. Great stuff. Finally, it prepares our hearts to receive the grace for which we ask. Okay, he doesn't say this, but I will. It's directly related to our repent, uh, uh, repentance and attachments. Look at the lives of saints. Our Lady of Fatima, I know these people's intentions, but they need to repent of sins first before I grant it. Uh, same thing with uh, Saint uh, other saints, right? Oh, I'll give that, but after they, they repent of their sins. Life of Saint Sebastian. Promised the patrician of a household he'd be healed. Invoked Christ, wasn't healed. He said, what idols are you still keeping in this house? The man had thrown out all of his idols, but his two favorites. They went and smashed the idols. The prayer was immediately granted. Finally, do not be over anxious for answers. The more our will is conformed to God, the stronger our prayer is. I'm very sorry for going over, brothers. However, I will mention that I omitted to talk about indulgences, which was a part of the chapter as well. I didn't feel, obviously, we have indulgences as an order. I hope you do strive to obtain indulgences for yourselves and others. Um, with that being said, I didn't feel that, I mean, there's so much material to cover. So on that note, I will go ahead and take questions. If you don't have any questions, if you could just type into the chat that you're um, you're all set, that would be great. Just by way of mentioning, we're still planning to have our retreat, we hope, in August while I wait for those questions. And um, I'll be working with Dom Jason to uh, and the other members of the Preceptoral Council to figure that out. Um, Dom, uh, Peter, oh, sure. Okay, so sensory devotion, coming and going. I hate to use the term warm, fuzzy feelings, but I feel like it, it best describes, it's like a warm, fuzzy feeling, but it's um, more intense. Um, it's, a, it's, in the it's like in the body and mind. And one feels uh, a sensory devotion is when they almost feel uplifted you know, by God. Uh, but the senses perceive the devotion is the best way to uh, describe it. So that could be, um, but it's generally more of a bodily phenomenon. It's not uh, like hearing uh, voices in your ears or uh, seeing things with your eyes, that's something else. It's when you feel in your being uh, the presence of God. 
And so with mental prayer, oftentimes we get these feelings. I know that a lot of people get these sensory devotions at mass during the consecration, right? If you've ever spoken to Christians, they oftentimes feel this deep devotion. Or if people are, uh, one person who gives a lot of this devotion is uh, when persons do things for or offer worship, uh, worship to God through the Virgin Mary, she oftentimes is very generous with feelings of consolation, hope, happiness, alleviations from pain, and things like that. We perceive those, um, that devotions in ourselves. So it's, it's more bodily, um, but it's uh, very much united to the, you know, the, the heart. Uh, is the way to kind of dis describe it. Do, does everybody, my trial, yes? Okay, good. Okay, well, any other questions, brother? By the way, there's nothing to be worried about if you don't feel those. Sensory devotions are considered... Um, something that beginners and God actually, um, okay, and God actually over time um, pulls those back because he wants us believing in him just with pure faith. That we make prayer just because we believe that it is pleasing to God. Okay. No other questions. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, one God. Amen. So please, if I you have not had a meeting with me recently, let's get something on the books. Uh, I know I have several postulants. Uh, if you don't have a specific schedule, please email me. Uh, letting me know that you want to keep moving forward and you want to set up a time. Thank you and God bless.